And finally, I want to introduce our, uh, our last speaker for today. Uh, Colin, Colin Lynn Adams is a, a, a registered occupational therapist. And he's living and working in the Galveston, Texas area uh, for about you know, over 12 years. He graduated from UTMB School of Allied Health Science and uh, in Occupational Therapy and a BS in 2004. He, right now he, he is a consultant for Adams Occupational Therapy Consulting, which he could say more about, and uh, also does a lot of consulting work in OT in the Galveston, Houston area. And he's going to be talking about occupational therapy perspectives and the elderly population living alone post-hospitalization. So we're covering the whole gamut of being in the hospital. Now we're looking at discharge. Okay. Thank you. That's me, Colin Adams. Uh, I'm an, actually an occupational therapist working primarily in the home health setting uh, from Houston all the way down to Galveston. Uh, it gives me a slightly different perspective than uh, oftentimes uh, inpatient or acute care or outpatient therapists because I am generally working specifically with the patient at home and I get to kind of see the benefits or ramifications of what happens here and how it flows back with the patient on their way home. Um, we're going to cover three fairly different areas. The whole portion, the whole purpose of this talk today uh, is to give you all just high impact advice and ways that, and things that you can implement into your uh, interactions with your patients with very little, with a limited amount of time that you actually have whenever you do see your patients. I, I have usually about an hour with each of my patients. I know that most clinicians don't have that long with them. I want to try to give you some screening assessment tools which you can use to make quicker decisions to whether to refer out or better understand where your patient actually is. Uh, three, uh, some strategies that you can give to your patients to improve their overall uh, health and lifestyle at home and then uh, be able to examine some basic considerations for when you're dis either discharging your patients or the environment that your patients are actually living in at home. Oftentimes when we speak to people, we, we ask, it's like when you meet somebody and you say, hello, how are you? And they say, oh, I'm fine. That's their instinctual answer. When you ask a patient, how are things going at home? They're gonna say, oh, I'm fine. And that's not always the case. You know, you, sometimes you have to look a little bit deeper beyond their first initial answer. And it's, I'm gonna try to give you guys the some quick ways to kind of dig in just a little bit more and be able to move forward with that. Um, first of all, a lot of people know occupational therapy as a term. Uh, occupational therapists kind of work in a large breadth of areas. Like I said, mine is specifically in home health and I work almost exclusively with the geriatric population. Uh, occupational therapists are trained to look at someone and look at their problems look at their skill set and figure out what you're not able to do, what, I, what we, being the patient and I, want them to be able to do, and then either by adapting their environment or training them to get them back to doing that. My whole, every day my whole purpose is just simply independence overall. It, it, uh, it doesn't include, it doesn't include things like uh, telling this patient, oh, you need to take this medication, or you need to have this test run, you, you need to do this. My, my area includes how functional are you outside of the acute setting, how functional are you at home, and how can I make sure that you're fully independent, okay? Uh, occupational therapists work in a variety of settings. Today we're going to talk about specifically uh, geriatric types of settings, acute care, skilled nursing facilities, uh, home health and outpatient services. Occupational therapists also work in uh, with uh, pediatric patients in uh, home settings and mental health settings, but that's going to be a little bit outside of our, our realm, which we're going to talk about today. Um, let's see. Okay. Independent assessments. These assessments are designed to be able for you all to be able to implement them quickly, give you the most information you can with a very limited amount of time. Uh, I, know as, I know, I'm sure it's the same for physical therapists, but as an occupational therapist, I had entire courses just simply on evaluation of patients and w what those evaluations mean. The difficulty is oftentimes those evaluations are extensive. They take more time than most clinicians, whether you're a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a PA, or 
or a geriatric uh, physician have time for. That's, you can defer that to the therapists. You can send that to us. These are going to be quick screens that you all can implement to say, okay, there might be a problem here beyond what my patient's just simply saying to me. First one specifically works with uh, mobility. For the PTs in the room, there's a lot more to it. We know. We're just going to simply try to go through this one. This one's called the timed up and go. The purpose is a short evaluation tool used to examine balance and mobility. Uh, it's simple. All you need to do is have you have your patient, you have a chair with armrests, and you have 10 meters of space. Who wants to volunteer? Either you volunteer or I pick you. All right. Uh, you. You make too much eye contact, you get asked to come up front. Uh, this test is short. It's simple. And, and it's, a, it's a positive screener. Have a seat. The idea of this test is for the patient to be able to rise from a seated chair with armrest, with their back fully against the back of the chair, stand up, make it 10 meters, I'm sorry, 3 meters, and then back. For a younger person like me or most of us here, this doesn't seem like a very big task. We just stand up, we walk, and we go back. For m many of our geriatric patients, actually getting across the room and back is actually a task. You know, they have uh, medical equipment they have to worry about, uh, energy conservation issues they have to worry about, and uh, just not falling when they turn. So th all you need to do is have the patient sit down, make sure they're fully back in the chair. Uh, you're not allowed to touch them at any, at any time during this assessment. And they need to rise, walk here, turn around, and have a seat. The timer will start the second I say go. Are you ready? <laughs> have a seat. Relax. Ready? Go. Okay, that took 10.8 seconds. The, whenever the person is doing this assessment, they need to be walking at a normal pace. They're not a race. I'm not, trying to I'm not trying to have this person hustle across the room and hustle back. Just a normal walk across the room. Now, whenever you implement this, what you need to do is give them one trial, the, a test run that you're not going to time them on just to make sure that they can safely make it there and back. Whenever I walk with my, any of my patients that I'm worried about their balance or mobility, I walk with them. I wasn't worried he was going to fall. So. If you fell, we got problems. We can talk. Uh, once they do it one time and back, then you say, okay, this time we're going to time you. Okay? And when they make it there and back, you're going to be able to time them. Anything, anything below 14 seconds, relatively normal, even as you increase the age. When you start crossing over 14 seconds for someone to rise, get over to this spot and back, uh, you really start increasing the risk that that person has a fall. Okay? It may not be whenever they do this test, but that indicates an inherent instability in their overall mobility, whether it be in the turn, whether it be in their ability to rise from the seated position, whether it be their ability just to simply traverse flat ground. Uh, 14 seconds in your mind. If this takes longer than 14 seconds, it needs to be a cue to you. We may have significant fall risk with this patient. You're done. You can have a seat. Right. Thanks. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to warn you now I'm bad with keeping up with my own slides. I just talk and then we'll go through it. Luckily, you all have handouts so we can kind of go through this as, as we do. Uh, one thing to talk about, this needs to be a normal walk. They need to have a normal pace, the normal shoes that they came to your office in. It doesn't have to be something special. This doesn't require any special equipment. You just need a chair and some space. So it's easy to implement. Uh, patient is given practice time. Normal health of the elderly usually completes it in 10 seconds or less. Uh, this can take, like I said, a very long time. Like you may have a patient you say, oh, it shouldn't be a big deal to walk across the room and back. This could take two minutes. And I have, oftentimes I have patients that do take that long. This is, gives you an idea of what it would take without any major problems. Now, like we talked about in the talk before mine, all of our patients have 
multiple morbidities. They have all kinds of problems. This is not looking specifically at a diagnosis like, oh, this person just had a total hip, or this person just had a total knee, or this patient, uh, you know, is deconditioned post pneumonia. This is a normal person with generally good health. As you start having people with different illnesses leaving the hospital from deconditioning all the way up, you're going to find that this number is going to increase, and you need to think this person's at a fall risk. The, this slide gives you some cutoffs for, you know, patients that are just generally dwelling at home and maybe frail and deconditioned, it's 14 seconds. Uh, Post-hip and fracture patients at the time of discharge, you need to give them a little bit more time. Just because they may be moving slowly doesn't necessarily indicate that they're a specific fall risk in itself. Okay. That one, the, the timed up and go is, is quick. It, it gives you a good indication. It usually uh, identifies 13 out of 15 per, uh, potential falling uh, patients. It, it gives you good indications without having to use a lot of time. Whenever I initially started looking at uh, ADL checks and the ability for a patient to do their uh, activities of daily living at home, every assessment I found was extensive. They, they just simply take an a, amount of time. Uh, you know, whenever I have a lot of time, it's not that, that big of a deal. But whenever you have 15 minutes to go through medications, you know, what's going on with your patient, what their mobility is, and everything else, you start running short of time. So instead of looking at what all uh, is, is included in a patient's ADLs, I'm going to give you guys some things to look for that would be positive indicators that this patient may have a problem. Oftentimes, whenever I do an evaluation with a patient, I walk into their home and I start talking to them. I ask, well, well, how are you doing getting dressed in the morning? And they'll say, I'm fine. Just like when I first meet somebody, how are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine isn't necessarily true. It may be. You, you may start probing with them. You may start talking to them and start finding out that, oh, they really can get dressed completely by themselves. Oftentimes, it's not true. Either it takes them an exceptionally long period of time to get dressed, or they just simply aren't able to get through the process cleanly. And you'll find that patients will start altering what they wear based on what they can put on. Uh, especially uh, my, my female patients, oftentimes you'll see them, they'll start wearing pullover nightgowns and things like that, even when they go to the doctor's office, simply because it's so much easier than trying to pull up pants, easier than trying to get on socks. They will use slip-on shoes in the simplest clothes. Uh, Whatever you start thinking about what these people need to be able to do, there's a lot of different components to it. There's a cognitive component. There's an uh, environmental component. Can they actually get to their clothes? These are things that, uh, as far as their environment, you can't see that from your office. You can ask them about it, but it's impossible to see from there. So with those being outside the realm of what you can touch at this point, whenever the patient's in your office or in an acute care setting, we're going to be looking at their basic abilities to reach. So whenever you have a patient, they, to be able to get up, get dressed, toilet, they need to be do, able to do certain things. First of all, my patient needs to be able to move from supine to sit. They need to be able to move from lying in bed to be able to sitting up. It's the first thing most of us do in the morning unless we sleep in an armchair. And you have to be able to do that. So whenever you have a patient that's laying in bed, you need to make sure that they can just sit up. And whenever I come see a patient, if they're laying down, I say, oh, can, can we get up? Do not help that patient up. You need to be able to truly assess, can that patient truly rise? The, the, the part inside my heart says, oh, the person's struggling. I need to help them. That's one thing you don't need, because you're actually robbing yourself of information when that patient gets up. So that patient needs to move from supine to sit to sit up. The next thing the patient needs to be able to do is reach down and touch their feet. Now, from a seated position, we're, we're, we're not going to ask somebody to stand up and reach down and touch their toes, but you would be surprised how many people just really can't do that. Well, I don't care if my patient can actually touch their toes to paint their toenails. All I care about is can my patient reach down far enough to be able to put their socks on, to be able to put their underwear on, can they pull up their pants. There's all kinds of things that are going to get in the way with that. Either it's their size, it's their uh, loss of range of motion and flexibility, it's just their, you know, it can be blood pressure issues. You can make have simply people that when they reach down and they come back up, they, they just simply become dizzy due to orthostatic. You know, they just have problems. So you need to have your patient seated and just have them reach down and touch their feet. Now, I have patients that can still get dressed independently that cannot touch their feet. 
How they do it oftentimes, without adaptive equipment or making things really interesting, it's simply they cross their legs. So either they can bring their foot up and they can touch their feet, I would classify that as acceptable. So my patient can reach down and touch their feet, or they can lift their leg and be able to get their feet. I know that both sides, I know that that patient can, at least with the range of motion, be able to reach down and put their underwear over their feet and bring it up high enough. If they can touch their ankles and lift their feet up, they can do that. Uh, the next item is reaching behind. Whenever you go to the restroom and you clean yourself, you have to be able to reach behind. Now, again, there's all kinds of reasons why someone might not be able to do this. Uh, arthritic shoulders, uh, morbid obesity, all kinds of issues. The patient needs to be able to clean themselves. So what you need to be able to look for at a minimum, at a minimum, is for the patient to be able to reach behind and place their hand on their bottom like this, okay? It requires, it requires more than you think. Now, this does not mean that that patient can toilet independently, but this is an indication if they can't at least do this, they can't clean themselves appropriately, okay? Uh, the next thing is being able to reach overhead. We're going to go over this again in a few minutes, but can everybody just reach over your head right now? Okay. For a lot of my patients, this is very difficult. They get to here and it's like, hello. It's, it's all elbow flexion. There's no shoulder flexion. They're not actually reaching up. This is limiting you in your ADLs, specifically in an inability to reach items, whether it's in your kitchen, be able to reach up overhead to put your shirt on, uh, to be able to do all kinds of things. So if they have a difficulty reaching up at least to 90 degrees of shoulder flexion, it's a good indicator that there's a problem and they probably have some difficulty with their ADLs. Uh, picking up an item from the ground. You know, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a patient's house and something has fallen on the ground and they drop it and it's, it's going to stay there. You know, from a standing position, reaching down and picking something up is often hazardous. Uh, I'm not going to ask a patient necessarily to pick something up while standing, but if they can at least be seated and be able to reach down and pick something off the floor, to me that's a real indication of a, probably a difficulty with ADLs, but also with safety at home. You know, if they can't clear their pass, if they can't be able to pick up an item, whether it's their medication or their remote, uh, that's a real indication of a problem. Now, it doesn't take long. You just ask the patient to touch their toes, reach up and get their feet, touch their back, reach up overhead, and just even reach down and touch the ground. It, it doesn't take you very long, but these are cueing indicators. If they can do them all, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're independent with their ADLs. If they can't do one of these, it's probably a good indicator that they're not, though. Uh, if they do have this, this doesn't give you a whole other mountain of problems that you need to traverse. I, if you if you're, look at these and you say, okay, this problem patient, even though they say, oh, I can do this by myself, may still have a problem with their ADLs, you can make a therapy referral. Either, I know that the acute care therapists are often busy with it, it, so many patients, you can either make an outpatient referral, you can make a home health referral, or when you're discharging a patient out, you can, uh, if they're going to a SNF placement, they can have a, a rehab referral when they get there. Let the therapists deal with the bigger implications of it all, but, it's, but therapists aren't with each patient. The nurses the, and the other clinicians are. You all have the eyes to be able to, to see whenever this might be a problem, even before the patient may realize that they have a problem. Maybe these are things that the patient was able to do before they went in the hospital, but after you know, uh, three days in the ICU and six days in a, on a regular floor, that patient is no longer able to do these things. And you need to be able to be watchful for it, even though they say, oh, I'll be fine when I go home. You know, okay, they, wa they will want to be okay, but are they actually completely independent with what they're doing? Ooh, ah. Okay, the mini cognitive test. You know, the mini cognitive test is very simple. It just takes three minutes. It entails giving somebody three items, I said, speaking to them, saying, okay, I'm going to ask you to remember three different things. I'm going to ask you to remember elephant, car, and sailboat. Can you repeat them back to me? Elephant, car, sailboat. Elephant, car, sailboat. Now, can you come up here? Again, too much eye contact. That means you're interested. Okay, can you make me a clock? A clock face, just the face. With the numbers.
Okay, can you write the hands on there to say 230? Okay. What were the three words that I asked you to remember? A cup. <laughs> <laughs> Try. Elephant, car, and uh, sample. Thank you. Oh, that's great. That's great. Ruined my many cognitive tests. Thank you so much. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. That's all it is. That's all it takes. Okay. It's, it's surprisingly more difficult. And don't worry if you can't remember one. It doesn't mean that you're completely off the reservation yet. Uh, there are lots of in-depth, highly sensitive uh, cognitive evaluations you can use. We don't have time to implement them oftentimes. This one is a solid indicator that are we looking at dementia, are we not looking at dementia. It's not about missing a single word. The, uh, so you get the patient's attention, you tell them the words, and then you ask the patient to repeat the three words. The, being able to recall the three words is more the primary indicator in this. The ability to draw the clock is more of a distractor, but it's also an informative distractor. It does give you some information uh, beyond just the ability to recall the three words. But the primary thing you're looking for is how many words can this person recall. Now, you still passed. Even if you only get two of them, you, without uh, three words recall is negative for cognitive impairment. One to two recall words is a, and a normal clock, relatively normal, we're not looking for artists, uh, is still negative. One to two recall, but an, uh, an abnormal clock, and I'm going to give you some examples of an abnormal clock, is a positive indicator. And of course, if you can't recall any of the three words, I wouldn't let you give up. Don't worry. You're not gonna, uh, it's obviously a positive indicator. Now, when we're talking about, uh, uh, this is a, a, a good clock. Yours is a great clock. You know, it's well spaced. Oftentimes I see this. I see the patient, okay, I know there's 12 numbers on a clock. I need to start writing them in. And they just start placing them in. And if, they're, if somewhere in their cognition it doesn't kick in that these need to be evenly spaced, it's, it's an indicator of declining faculty. You, it's the indicator that there's some, while I understand what you were asking me to do, the resources that I have inside my brain are not coming to fruition and they're not allowing me to do this. You see this. This one, oftentimes you see, is an indicator you already knew something was wrong. Okay? But you often see things like this one and this one in patients with emerging dementia. Uh, I, this test doesn't, al doesn't afford you the ability to make the distinction between the two because it is such a short exam. But bear in mind, in the background, these are oftentimes what we're going to see. Okay? If it's close, if it's pretty close, you know, we're not looking for artists, then you get two out of the three words, you know, 90% of the time you're going to be okay to think that their cognition is relatively good. This, if, if for some reason they fail or they're on the line, that's an indicator that you might want to make a referral out. Or at least look, spend more time looking at what the cognition of the patient is overall. Okay. Health promotion advice. Don't worry, I will not, like a good preacher on Sunday, I won't let you guys out of here really, really late. I won't let the sermon go too long. This advice is advice that you can give to your patients to be able to positively impact their overall health at home that they might actually follow. You know, as a therapist, I have all kinds of home exercise programs and I have all kinds of advice to give patients, but it seems like only the the, the easiest advice to them, the thing that requires the least amount of work or is the easiest to implement, is what they actually do. Uh, so that's what I'm going to try to give you guys. So the, this advice trying to get pretty much has the most bang for the buck. Walk. Oh my goodness, walk. Uh, anybody that works in geriatrics knows that there's a, a whole mountain of data and analysis looking out there about what walking does for you. As somebody that sees at least 30 to 40 visits a week of patients in their homes. My patients that walk, even just three days a week, do so much better pre-acute uh, uh, incarceration, no, uh, pre-acute admission and post. If you're simply walking, there's too many levels to go over with this. I can make a whole talk just on walking. Uh, it improves your overall health, your mobility, uh, getting caught up on the idea. Uh, 
if there's one thing that, that you could tell your patients to do, it's walk. Whenever I was younger, uh, I'm from East Texas, uh, not far from SFA, and back there, everybody had mall walking early in the morning. You would see these, these, patient, these people that would go to the mall at like 7 a.m. the second the doors open, and they would just simply make laps around the inside of the mall. In partners and buddies, these people were maintaining their mobility. It was a social form, but it made a huge impact on their health. Specifically here in the South, we oftentimes have people that are more sedentary. You know, we drive everywhere we go. You know, and when it's hot in the summer, most of our elderly people don't go outside because it's just too hot to get out and about. It creates this sedentary lifestyle, and that lifestyle leads to multiple problems beyond obesity, diabetes, higher blood pressure, you know, decreased joint mobility, everything. If people can walk just a little bit, you're going to improve all of those. Uh, cardiovascular health, uh, diabetes, bone density, specifically in postmenopausal women. Uh, there's a lot of research that indicates that women postmenopausal, specifically if they start walking significantly in their 50s and continue that uh, habit through elderly life, your bone density is significantly improved. Uh, lower blood pressure, improved balance, decreased anxiety. If I ask my patient, okay, listen, I want you to go to the gym three days a week and I want you to work out, they're not going to do it. If I give them a home exercise program, unless they have somebody to really push them or they're highly motivated in themselves, they're probably not going to do the home exercise program unless somebody's really pushing them. They're not going to get that cardiovascular exercise. They're not going to get that activity that they need. At, oftentimes I see patients with high stress levels, high, uh, uh, high levels of depression, all kinds of anxiety related to being at home, increased isolation, decreased social interaction. Get a walking partner and walk. You're using up this extra energy that you're not, you're spending on anxiety and you're actually making it constructive and you're helping yourself overall. You're going to get decreased anxiety uh, and it oftentimes increased social drive. These people want to, the more you're active you are, the more you want to be out and be active. Uh, and improve sleeping. We all know that if we exercise during the day, you're a little more tired, you're going to sleep a little better. If you're not doing anything, you have a just a little bit too much energy late at night to actually be able to go home and go sleep well. So, uh, Recommended 30 minutes of walking a day. It doesn't take, I, I'm not looking for power walkers here, I'm not looking for Olympic medalists. I'm just simply looking for somebody that wants to casually walk at whatever pace they can do, probably about three miles an hour. It can be around their home, it can be up and down their street, it can be at the store. Oftentimes you find people that shop a lot more, end up doing more walking. So there you go. Just tell your patient, if you'd like to go shopping some more, please go. Just push the cart with you whenever you go. Uh, stretching. Okay. Stretching helps. Stretching does help. Oftentimes you see elderly populations, as you get a little bit older, you start getting aches and pains and small, you know, twinges in your shoulder. Oh, my lower back hurts, so I don't do that, you know. Uh, my knees hurt so I don't squat all the way down. These are common things we hear. So what do we do? We stop doing those things. So actually in avoidance, we don't want to hurt, so we just avoid it altogether. That leads to decreased range of motion. It, it leads to joint stiffness, and it leads to you being less mobile and less independent at home. Okay? You, for, now there's all kinds of reasons why you can have joint pain and decreased mobility. We're talking, you know, I'm not talking about people that had, you know, a total... Uh, shoulder arthroplasty last month. I'm not talking about patients with major reconstructive surgery of their hips. I'm talking about the patients who is generally deconditioning. You, you start reaching, you go to your cabinet, and, and I ask these patients to do this, and I was like, okay, well, grab the, grab the can of beans from the top cabinet, and they'll reach up, and they'll get it, oh, it hurts, and they'll get it down. So what they start doing is they start moving everything from the top cabinet down to the middle cabinet. And so now, oh, well, I can just avoid that. I don't have to reach all the way up, because now I've changed everything, and, I, and all I have to do is this which is no, no real shoulder flexion. You're just reaching up and you're putting it down. Sounds great. Now I don't hurt and I can still get the things out of my cabinets. The problem is you're not reaching up. And if you find that after six months of doing that, have you actually reached over your shoulders, I mean, over your head in that time? No, you don't. Stretch. You, don't, you only have to make one full length muscle stretch a day to not lose muscle specific length. Okay. All I'm asking my patients to do is this isn't for improving Flexibility, this is maintaining flexibility. It can be very simple. Whenever I, when I watched everyone reach up, everyone reach up again, patients with shoulder pain that reach up with their palms down hurt. 
okay? And you'll find that the, the, instead of reaching all the way up, they kind of reach like this. One thing, when you tell your patients to reach up, try this, thumbs up, thumbs up. You're reorienting, or, uh, you're reorienting the head of your humerus into a better position. I have patients with even significant arthritis. Whenever they turn their thumbs up and then reach up, you're going to get more range of motion, less pain. Okay? So ask them to reach all the way up, thumbs up, once a day. Whenever you stick, get up in the morning, thumbs up, like, like you're clapping your hands, straight up. Okay? Next, uh, touch your toes. And I, again, I'm not talking about standing, touching your toes. I don't want someone to be like, yes, Colin, I had four patients fall last month because you told them to touch their toes. I'm talking about just sitting down and reaching down towards your feet. Once you lose that ability, it is gone. It is so difficult to get back. Uh, reach down towards your feet as far as you can, okay? The third item is squat down. Now, I don't mean that you have to squat all the way to the ground. I know, look, your face, it's like, oh my God, I have to squat. Okay, this is preventative. If you start doing this and you start trying to implement this with your patients before they start having very significant problems, you're gonna be much better off. When I say squat down, I mean you stand at your sink and you hold both hands on your sink and just down, okay? And straight back up, okay? Just, even if you just do it once, more times is obviously better, but still, all the way down. You, they could secure themselves with the sink and just all the way down. I'm not asking somebody to put themselves in a compromising situation or a place where they're gonna fall over, but squat down as far as you can with your feet shoulder width apart and just all the way down. Even if you have to pull yourself up, even if you don't have the driving strength to pick yourself up without pulling, at least you're ranging all the way through. I guarantee you it's a lot lower than any of them have gone probably in a long time. Those three things, you've ranged those joints all the way through the day, I, I, all the way through the range as best they can, and it only took a couple seconds. Okay, and they don't even have to do them all at the same time. You know, hey, the next time at your sink, and before you turn the water on, try to squat all the way down and stand up. They can do these things. They're not difficult, but they can get a lot of benefit from them. Stay mentally engaged. For the, uh, for the sake of time, I won't get too much into staying mentally engaged. Most people probably in this room understand that being mentally engaged with a geriatric population is key. Uh, when you I see this all the time in men. I, I see men that are 60 and they retire and they are so excited that they get to retire because they don't have to work at the plant anymore. They don't have to go here or there or doing that kind of stuff and they have the greatest plans. I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy a truck, I'm gonna buy a boat, and I'm gonna go fishing every day, or I'm gonna build a plane, or I'm gonna do all this stuff. And then a year later, you ask them what they're doing and they're watching the prices right at 10 o'clock, okay? Sitting in their armchair. The sedentary lifestyle leads to ruin in, in, in an elderly population. I, I hate to say that, but it's true. You know, you, you're not only physically not using your body, but you're not using your mental faculties either. You know, I'm not asking people to spend four hours a day on luminosity and, and be able to do all kinds of special things. I'm asking people to stay mentally engaged. You need to f you, these patients need to find a hobby, need to find some way to c keep their mind engaged, because just like that range of motion with their bodies, they're going to lose that ability if they do not work on it, okay? Uh, find a hobby, read a book, play a game, get them get their grandkids to teach them a new card game or something. Make them stay mentally active. Uh, the, the, the countries you look at that with populations that don't retire or retire later in life, you find that oftentimes those people have better outcomes. Uh, there was a study several years ago about the Georgia Republic of Russia and the number of centennial citizens that they had. Their culture doesn't oftentimes include retirement. They may lessen the amount of hours that they work each day, but they're but every day, even in their 90s, they get up and they go do a task. They're staying mentally and physically engaged, which is keeping them in better overall health, okay? Again, for the, for the sake of time, we're not going to kill each other with that one. Discharging in, uh, patients and where they're living at home. Okay, this is something that's pretty close to my heart. Oftentimes, I see patients that live specifically in Galveston, they truly live alone. Either they live alone in the sense that they are at home all day by themselves, during the day, or they're home totally by themselves uh, 24 hours a day, or they're at home, but they say, oh, no, I have people there. What they really mean oftentimes is, oh, my neighbor can come over sometimes, or my son lives in Texas City, or my daughter lives in Bay Cliff, and they can come down and help me. It's important to be able to truly understand what kind of living environment your, pa 
your patients are living in or headed home to because it makes a great deal of difference, it's specifically post-acute. You know, in an environment they may have been able to live in perfectly fine before going in the hospital, they may have a significant trouble with now. Uh, first of all, minimum considerations for somebody who is living at home 24-7. There's a lot of different things that you need to be able to do to live at home alone safely as a geriatric as, as a person, elderly person. The patient uh, needs to be able to make their own meals. They need to bathe, not necessarily in a bathtub. I, a lot of my patients don't take baths. They take sponge baths they, because it's just simply too dangerous for them to be climbing in and out of a bathtub and a shower because they have nobody else there with them. Uh, but they need to be able to clean themselves prepare their own food, and take care of home management. But by home management, you know, it, that includes bill, paying your bills, but it, more importantly, it includes maintaining your home to a degree that you're able to be safe getting around the home, making sure that you're able to deal with a, just the day-to-day -day things that, you know, changing out the toilet roll uh, by the toilet, all these little tasks. There's a lot to it. Just being at home alone and living and existing at home is not, is not enough. Uh, the patient must be able to shop for themselves or at least be able to get somebody to be able to shop for them. They must be able to use the phone and they must be able to uh, organize their appointments and uh, medications. These are very significant tasks for anybody but even more of a burden on our geriatric population who uh, either through confusion or lack of mobility or a whole slew of different things is going to have problems with this beyond their standard home management tasks. These are, for your patients that truly live alone, you need to have a very high bar in your mind about what they're able to do and what you're sending them home to because it's a lot. Okay, what I see more than that is uh, patients that live alone but, but close assistance close by. I would also lump closely with this uh, patients that live alone during the day. You know, lots of times patient, elderly people, they live with their children, but their children are still working. So th these people have to deal with what's going on in their day by themselves at home. This would include, uh, they must be able to perform toileting tasks and bathing tasks. They must be able to get food from the kitchen. I'm not asking these people to cook necessarily, but they need to be able to either go into the kitchen and get food, or I've seen people put coolers near their near where they're sitting that way they don't have to worry their mom and dad doesn't have to go inside the kitchen and get food they just simply have to get it from there but they have to be able to get food and water they have to be able to toilet they have to be able to exit the home okay i'm not asking patients to get down the street or drive what i'm considering is patients must be able to get out of the home if there's a fire and something's going on my patient must be able to eat you know get out the front door and get at least 10 feet away okay that may be a, a tall task for a lot of my patients but you know when you have death and smoke moving towards you, oftentimes they'll be highly motivated to move out the front door, but they have to be able to do it effectively. Uh, and they have to be able to contact emergency services and handle basic home logistics. What I mean by that is, even if you set up your, your medications in your patient's pill bottles and, and set it all out for them, they have to be able to comprehend and deal with getting through that, even if it's just for eight or 10 hours at a time. These are considerations that you need to be able to be comfortable that this patient is able to t take on if that patient's at home. Oftentimes when we discharge patients and say, oh, I'm going to be okay, my son will be there. I'm sure your son will be there and I'm sure your son has the best intentions, but what does that mean? Does that mean my son only leaves me for like an hour and a half? I have, I've seen that situation. My grandmother is at home with Alzheimer's and my mother takes care of her. Uh, up until a year ago, she was comfortable with leaving her for an hour because she was safe at home and she was able to get around. She's gotten to the point where she can't do that anymore. Are we asking, is that person going to leave you for an hour and is that okay? If it is, then no big deal. Or is that patient, or is that person working all day? And even though I'm living with my son, am I really alone? Uh, and oftentimes it's, that's the case. Uh, alone during daytime hours, I kind of lump the two of them together but because the concepts are pretty similar. But as the amount of time that that person is actually alone individually decreases, so does the burden on that patient. You know, you want people to be as independent as possible, but if you're only going to be alone for an hour and a half, it's not that big of a deal. I know people that say, you know, as long as they can get out the front door and they can reach that water bottle that's next to them, that's all they need to be able to do for an hour. I would include toileting, but a lot of my patients won't include that because they think that I'm not going to be alone that long. Things to think about. Um, okay, whenever you're discharging a patient home, lots of times they think, oh, sorry. Uh, 
you got to think about where they're going. Are they going home? Are they going to a SNF for rehab? Which I'm actually, even being in home health, I'm actually a fan of. Uh, even if it's for a 20-day stay after coming out of the hospital, they get 20 days of therapy and covered nursing care before they go home. It's a bridge. It's a bridge that most patients would need to benefit from before going home and they can be safer, specifically with the patients that live totally alone. Uh, if you live totally alone and you're going to be dropped into a situation where you have to cover everything yourself, you need to make sure that patient's able to do that or try to give them a bridge to be able to get back home, kind of a step down unit. Uh, things to think about, home health services. Home health services, you know, including nursing and therapy, but other you know, social work services, they have limitations. Oftentimes people think, well, I'm just going to send them home with home health and, that's gonna, and everything's going to be okay. Just because someone has home health services does not mean that those home health people are able to take care of that person. You may have a nurse come in one day, you may have a therapist come in the next day, but it doesn't mean that, oh, this person's going to have you know, constant supervision or that those people are going to be able to take care of, you know, oh, well, they'll help her take care of stuff. You know, they'll be able to take care of her dishes a little bit or do with other kind of stuff. Oftentimes that's not the case. You know, specifically if you just have nursing and therapy going in, I know as a therapist, I try to help my patients as much as I can, specifically the ones that need more help, but I can't say that everybody's going to be able to go out of their way for that patient when they go home. So while home health services are a valuable asset for those people, you can't depend on them to make it safe at home. You have to be honest with yourself. How safe is this person going to be when they are at home? That being said, bar very complicated or extensive medical issues, patients respond better at home. They're happier in their home environment. They're around their own things. They, their, their energy levels oftentimes are better. So I like my patients being at home, but it's not always the best thing. I've gone to patients', patients houses here in Galveston where that patient is alone all during the day and the door is locked and they are in bed and that's all there is. And there's no way they could get out of the house. There's no way they could toilet. There's no way any of that. And that's common. It's much more common than you think. And those same people come to your clinics. They get their, their sons or daughters come and pick them up and they bring them to your office and they clean them up and that's when you see them and they think, oh, they're going home with their son or daughter. But really what it is is they're locked inside the house during the day. You have to look a little bit deeper about what these people are actually able to do. Uh, a really good resource is Meals on Wheels. I know you all probably know about it, but make that referral more. There, there's at least three companies in Galveston that do Meals on Wheels, specifically for these patients that live totally at home alone. They need to be able to have access to food, and it's a very positive resource. And uh, provider services, oftentimes provider services, it's kind of interesting. People with a lot of money can pay a provider. People on Medicaid can apply for a provider. People in the middle don't get that. Uh, without getting into a, a whole discussion about it, provider services aren't an option for everybody. Okay? So don't just say, well, that person can get a provider. Lots of times they can't. Okay? I'm sorry to rush the whole thing. I just wanted, didn't want to get you guys out of here too late. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. First of all, I go to medicine for grand rounds and other grand rounds, but I enjoy this the most. The second thing is my wife is 89 and she's very sharp mentally and she uses a walker at home. But last week she walked without a walker and fell backwards on Trazor. And uh, her curvature of the spine kept her hair above. And uh, that was a, her gluteus maximus suffered the, the worst part. But uh, she was very, if she hadn't had kyphosis on the spine, she would have died on the spot. And, and, and it's easy to happen. You know, a lot of people have their walkers and they're fine. And they walk away, they think, I'm just going to get that right there. And they walk away. And then suddenly, what was a balanced, stable person is no longer a balanced, stable person. It can happen really. It's scary. It can happen easily. Was there another question? Yes, ma'am. In thinking about the transition from, ho from hospital to home, with the, the, most of our patients are doing that transition, home with home health. If, if there is an error that you identify in that transition as a therapist receiving them, can, are there a few that pop in your mind as sort of the most common? You know, uh, I, I have a patient right now that normally I would be seeing right now that had no idea that her nurse at the home health company 
could help her whenever she wasn't coming to check on her. She, th she had a medical issue that I came across that she was already pre-identified and she was having a difficulty with and I said, well, why didn't you call the nurse or the home health company? They're available 24 hours a day to help you and that's any home health company that's worth their salt. That's true. She said, I had no idea that was an option. Making sure that you explain to them what that home health company's role is, no matter what company it is. I work for a whole bunch of them, but, and there are some that are better than others, but making sure you tell them, not just I'm gonna recommend home health for you, tell them I'm recommending home health for your nursing and for your therapy, or just for your nursing, and say those people are there to check on you, to help you, medica uh, help you manage your medications, but also if you have a medical problem that's not a 911 emergency, you need to call them. I don't care if it's 3 a.m. on Sunday morning, that they have people on call, they pay money to have people ready to help you. That is their whole role. And it's difficult for people to understand that. It's also difficult for people to want to pull the trigger on that. So they, so they stay in pain or they have medical issues for a day and a half more until, well, on Monday I'll call Dr. Hummel and I'll go in and see her. Or I'll go see somebody else. Or I'll see, or I'll see Colin, my therapist, on Monday when he comes at 3. You know, make sure they understand what it actually means. The other thing that I find oftentimes with these people transitioning home is actually understanding what their diagnosis is and what's going on with them. I have a, I, I see this one a lot. I had a stroke. Oh, really? Do you know what a stroke is? They have no idea what a stroke is. I mean, some people say, it's just a word. You know, everybody understands heart attack, but things like stroke or other diagnoses, to them it's just a word that's said to them, and they, they've been trained to nod yes and understand yes, okay, I understand that. Making patient education, even if it's just simple, gives the, my patients ownership and allows them to better understand what's going on to them. And once you explain it to them, they're like, oh my goodness, you mean a section of my brain is dead and not working anymore? Yes. Oh. It's frightening to them, but also they can understand it. And then you can, from there, you can say, okay, this is what we can do about it, or this is where we're headed, or this is why they're doing that. They're, they'll say, oh, my doctor just gave me 10 more medications I don't need to worry about. Well, I can't explain all of them. Lots of times I can say, well, these, this might be their thinking behind it, behind why they're doing that. If they just have a little bit of ownership of what's going on with them, I oftentimes find that they're more engaged. Because if they don't understand anything, lots of patients have this step back mentality where like, okay, I don't understand. It's too much for me. I'm not going to try to understand. I'm just going to be ferried through the system. And, and it's just because they don't understand. And, they don't have to, and you need to do it in terms that they can understand, not in, in so much medical jargon, just uh, basic ideas, okay? This is what happened to you. And it really makes a difference. Those are the two big ones. I really appreciate you all being as attentive as you have been. I'm sorry to keep you a little bit longer than 3 o'clock, but I also appreciate the opportunity to come and speak before you. This is, uh, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you.